Hello, I'm back. Thanks for bearing with me. All right, now I'm gonna try to get into what happened in court on Tuesday, November 7th, day 12 in the Norman Seabrook trial. All right, they covered a lot. The, the session started at nine o'clock a.m. and it ended at five. So you could imagine all they covered. Both sides were given an opportunity to present their case. And um, that they did. So the prosecution went first. And if you saw my last video, I went through the timeline of events concerning the $20 million investment. So I'm not gonna go through it again, word for word. I'm just gonna try to point out some of the things that weren't in that last video that the, the prosecution talked about yesterday. Um, they went, of course, on a trip to the Dominican Republic, Jonah and um, Norman Seabrook. And at this meeting, they have a video of a dinner that Norman was at and Norman's making a toast. Now, I don't know whether it's the same dinner um, because they went a lot of places. They went to the Dominican Republic. They went to um, Israel and other places. So they have this video of Norman, Norman making a speech. He has a glass of wine and he's saying how, port, how important friendship is to him. And, um, you know, he's kind of emotional. They are saying that during this trip is when Norman started talking about, you know, how he really felt that he, you know, was a was a union boss, but other people were getting paid because of the funds that he was managing, the financial advisor, you know, the lawyers, everybody's getting paid except for him. And it was time for him to get paid. And at that point, that is when the prosecution is saying that this whole scheme was hatched. Um, Jonah Resnick told Seabrook, yeah, you know, I have a partner that's managing a hedge fund. So, um, let me talk to him and maybe we could work something out for you to get paid. So the government has the series of phone calls that took place um, between Resnick and Huberfeld. They don't have the content of the phone calls, but they have the um, Verizon records that these phone calls were placed. Um, then Res Resnick is saying that Huberfeld came up with a formula. Now this formula was considered a two and 20 formula. I am not an accountant, nor am I a stock trader or a hedge fund manager or anything like that. So I don't, I'm not really clear on all the particulars of the formula, but it's sort of like they were saying that if Norman invested $20 million um, and the fund went up 50%, um, like Jonah was saying that Huberfeld was telling Norman to, was, was encouraging Norman to put $20 million in the fund because he knew it was gonna go up 50% very soon, like within the month. So if Norman invested the $20 million um, and, it went, and it went up 50%, excuse me, and it went up 50%, um, it would be a $10 million profit. And from that $10 million profit, it would be 20% of that $10 million profit, which would be $2 million. From that $2 million, he would get 10%. Norman would get 10% of the $2 million. Now, Jonah calculated this at $100,000. $100,000. This is what Norman, that, that he told Norman, this is what Resnick is saying he told Norman he would get if he invested $20 million in Platinum Partners. I hope you guys can see this because I don't want to have to write this again. I should have wrote it in red. <laughs> but, um, but those of you who know a little bit about math, you know that 10% of $2 million is not $100,000. Okay? We're going to get into that later. But that is what um, Resnick is saying that Huberfeld told him to tell Norman. So this is where the $100,000 a year, he said about $100,000, $150,000 that Seabrook would be getting. So 
that is the lead off to this whole scheme. All right. Now, they also talked about the bag again. And I know I spoke about the bag and um, they, shat, they had the video of um, Jonah Resnick coming out of the Ferragamo store with the bag. Now, remember, he said he gave this as a gift to Seabrook that, and, and it contained $60,000, okay? He's coming out of the Farragamo store. He just purchased the bag and the bag is around his neck and draped around his neck like this. They show him leaving the store and then they show him going into his office building through the doors. They have a surveillance camera in the building so they show him coming through with this bag. Then about 15, late, 15 minutes later, they show him leaving the same building with the bag and he's holding the bag like this in his hand and he's walking out of the building. So they're saying that that was the $60,000 in that bag and they showed the surveillance, excuse me, the footage of C. Brooks's license plate of his car coming to Manhattan. Not too long after that, they show the flurry of phone calls that are happening between Murray Huberfeld and um, Jonah Resnick and Jonah Resnick and Norman Seabrook. And they show the, the um, email that was sent to Huberfeld about the reimbursement of the $60,000 um, with the invoice for the Knicks tickets. Okay, they, they talk about all of these things and they say that the Knicks tickets were fake I mean, they, the Knicks tickets weren't fake, but the invoice for the Knicks tickets was, were fake because that was just to cover the transaction to try to make it look legal. And they're saying that the, um, the Knicks tickets never were possessed by Platinum Partners, even though Platinum Partners paid the $60,000 and they were supposed to get the tickets. They have video footage of all the games I think it's about eight games that they were supposedly sold to Platinum Partners. The seats, the seats are floor size seats, um, Madison Square Garden, Knicks tickets, and every shot that they showed, it was either Jonah Resnick in those seats or his friends. So they're saying that the tickets were just the, the whole invoice and that whole transaction was fake. It was just to cover the $60,000 that um, was paid to Norman as a bribe. Um, they said that $90,000, uh, I mean 90%, 90 excuse me, 90% of the COBA's rainy day fund was tied up in Platinum Partners after Seabrook um, gave them $5 million out of the um, general fund and they showed a chart and they said that the, um, the balance had at some point went from like over six million down to about 300,000 because of this investment, okay? They also went to, they talked about the money that they found in Norman Seabrooks' house. Um, they said they found $27,000 in cash in Norman's house. Um, they also, said they, they found um, $21,000 in his safe. And this is significant because they're saying, I'm gonna put this formula back up again, but for now I'm gonna take it down. I hope you were able to see that. Um, they're saying that he had envelopes that was stuffed with money. And on the envelopes, they showed the envelopes. The envelopes, I think two of them had this on it, 10, M on it, so you had two envelopes with 10 M on it, and wait, maybe you had, well I know you had, I'm not gonna try to get technical, but you had an envelope that had 10 million on it, and then you had an envelope that had 5 million on it. There was a third envelope, and I'm not sure exactly what it had on it, it might have had 5 million or 10 million, so I'm not gonna put it up, because I couldn't see it, but um, they're saying that this represents the millions of dollars that Norman invested and the payoff, so the envelope contained um, thousands of dollars and it represented the amount of money he had put into the Platinum Partners front, um, Fund. 
So he was, they said that he used that to try to keep track of the money that he had been paid out already. So this meant 10 million and this meant 5 million. Maybe there was another one that said 5 million, which would equal 20 million. And they said that's what those um, words were on his envelopes that he had the money in, okay? Now, they also looked at the cash deposits in C. Brooks's personal accounts after December um, 11th, 2014, which was the date that he allegedly received the $60,000. And they noted that there were some cash deposits. Um, they also spoke about Mohican Sun, the casino, and they noted that Seabrook had made $21,000 in payment on markers that he had owed the casino in cash. And um, it equaled 21,000, it was three payments, so it was like seven and six and six or whatever. Um, so they went into that. Um, so it's basically the information that we already know or that we've already heard, you know. And then they went into, of course, Abe, um, not Abe, I keep calling him Abe, Murray Huberfeld's background because, you know, he's the co-defendant in this case. And so they went painstakingly through the transactions and they noted that he was desperate and that the fund was losing money and they needed more institutional investors. One of the brokers had sent an email to everyone telling them that this is cold red, we have to get this done. So that's why they were pushing to, for Norman to send this money in. And um, they said that Huberfell also had his own personal money invested in his fund and his family's money in the fund. And he was getting a percentage of the um, commission for this fund. So that was his motivation for entering into this deal. Now, let me see if there's anything that I'm missing that you haven't heard already. Okay, fake invoice, okay. I think we've covered the um, prosecution. Um, they wrapped it up by saying that, that the correction officers were defrauded here, that the COBA members are the victims and that we were hardworking individuals and um, this was done to benefit Norman and Murray Huberfeld and it wasn't done to um, help the membership. Okay, they talked about the letters that Norman didn't pass on from the um, lawyers and advisors concerning Platinum Partners, the due diligence letters and things like that. That oh, They also said that those letters had the names of all the members of the annuity fund board on it and they had meant that they all should see the letter, but Norman didn't allow them to see the letter. He just um, kept it for himself, okay? That's the prosecution's position. Now, we're gonna get into the defense's position. Now, Seabrook, Seabrook's lawyer is Paul Sheckman, all right? He started by going into Seabrook's career. And he said that in 95, Norman was elected um, president of the COBA, and he has served five consecutive terms. He was elected five times to the presidency of the COBA. Um, they had some testimony that they had gotten from um, Hasamuddin that was talking about his style and that he had known him for over 20 years, and he was the type of person that you had to bring your A game if you were dealing with him. And they asked Hasmuddin, what did he mean by that? And he said that if you had a point of view, you better be able to defend it because you know you were gonna be challenged on it and you had to bring your A game. And that was one of the qualities that I think that he liked about Norman. So all the things that were being said about Norman were positive and you know, praise, praising him for the job that he had done through the years for the correction officers. Um, 
And then, of course, as we know, they started pointing the finger at Jonah Resnick. And um, if you have seen my first video, I told you that this guy is a straight up con artist. Low down dirty dog, that's what I called them. And they just went for him, you know. They brought up all the things that he had done. Um, I didn't get into them on my first video, so I'll touch on some of the things right here and you can get a better picture of this guy. Um, of course, he was sucking up the power. I mean, he would take police officials on trips, you know, buy them things, try to be close to them, try to be friendly with them, try to get favors for them, pretty much corrupting them, you know, taking them on private jets and boats and things like that. And um, he was able to get preferred seats at the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Um, he was able to get escorts by police when he went to the airport with sirens and the whole nine. Um, he used the Holocaust as a justification for him, you know, wanting to be around police officers to try to help um, his people and that his grandparents were Holocaust survivors and he always felt it was important to make friends with the police and, you know, people in high places. So it can hopefully prevent another holocaust because he was so concerned about his people um the, and it was later proven to understand that he just said those things to um make people like him or make him seem like he was doing all this for a good reason but in reality he was just saying these things and he didn't really mean them and this is an important point because you got to remember seabrook's co-defendant is um, Murray Huberfeld, who is a Hasidic Jew, he's Jewish and he had a whole lot of Jewish um, people in the, in the um, spectator area watching this and um, they were really um, offended. These type of things offend Jewish people when you use the Holocaust for your own personal gain. You know, so they show what type of person he is. Um, they also talked about his health care benefits, which I talked about, where he was getting health care benefits not only for himself, but for his wife and his five children from a jewelry store that he didn't work at, you know. And I went into that in other videos. Um, he also got a chaplaincy. He also was deemed the chaplain of Westchester County Police Department. Not because he had any religious background. He didn't have any religious background. He just made donations and he purchased a watch for a um, Westchester County executive and he was given the chaplaincy of the police department. And he said that he only did all of that. So he, he only wanted to be chaplain so he could receive a parking plaque to put on his car. So this is the type of guy he is. He had no intention of helping anybody, attending any ceremonies, counseling any families or anything like that. He just wanted a parking, parking plaque to go on his car. Um, he also engaged in the Super Bowl scam. I know I, I didn't speak about this, but they say that he had a friend, a guy that he made believe that was his friend. He, made this guy believe, his name is Weinstein, I think, he made him believe that he was his best friend. They had emails going back and forth between him and Weinstein, and he's telling Weinstein, hey, you know, when I leave the city, the only people I miss is my wife and you, man. You're like my best friend in the world, blase, blase, blase. And the guy's like, yeah, man, you know, I really appreciate our friendship and things like that. So he made it seem like it was mutual. And this guy was rich, so, he pulled this scam on him. He told him that um, his company, one of the companies that he was involved in with another gentleman, um, was purchasing Super Bowl tickets and asked his friend, do you want to be a part of the deal? And his friend's like, yeah, sure. So he told him like this, this deal is um, going to be um, $3.8 million for this deal. We're going to buy Super Bowl tickets and then we're going to sell them and we're going to reap the benefits. So I'm going to come in with 1.9 million. You come in with 1.9 million and, you know, we'll get the tickets and then we'll sell them and then we'll split the profits. 
And his friend was like, yeah, sure, okay, you're my friend, you know, let's do it. So he gave Resnick the $1.9 million. Now, in reality, the Super Bowl tickets only cost $1.2 million. So Resnick and his partner in crime, they bought the, the tickets and then they took the other 650,000 or 700,000 and split it amongst themselves. You know, that's how they treated this friend, this so-called friend. They had all this documentation about how, you know, they had in emails going back and forth and Resnick was saying how much he liked this guy. So this is the type of guy that we're talking about. Um, they said that he wooed Seabrook that he um, bought, he knew Seabrook liked cigars, so he bought him cigars. When Seabrook told him that the union office was at 75 Broad Street, he said, oh, I own 15 Broad Street, even, even though he didn't. He told me, and I own 25 Broad Street. I used to own 25 Broad Street, and I also own 23 Wall Street. All of these are lies in order to get close to Seabrook. And um, he knew Seabrook liked Ferragamo, so he purchased, he, used to, he would buy Seabrook Ferragamo shoes. Of course, he would take them on trips. You know, he took them on private jets. He took them on, yacht, on a yacht and things like that. Went to dinner, went to private cigar clubs and things like that. So he was trying to ingratiate himself to Seabrook because he knew Seabrook um, controlled the um, COBA and he wanted to be close to that power. And he wanted to, um, you know, once he found out that Seabrook was, was, was wanted to invest, that he thought he could get a part of that too, you know. And it wasn't just Seabrook that he was chumming around with, you know. We know that he was friends with the mayor and the mayor's um, campaign person. He had the mayor's personal cell phone number as well as his personal email address and he would email the, 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 the mayor and um, he would try to get the mayor to do things for his friends. So he would write the mayor email, you know, a nice friendly email and then, excuse me, and then alter the email to look like he was berating or, or telling the mayor what to do. And he would send that altered email to his friends to make it look like he was very important. Um, he also had the police department shut down a lane in the Lincoln Tunnel so he could bring his friend through. And they asked him why he did that. And he said that, you know, he just wanted to impress his friend. So. That's the type of person he was. That's the type of influence this guy had. And this, this is why I say this guy was dangerous because it wasn't just that he was scamming people out of millions of dollars. He was trying to cozy up the power. So in my, in my um, opinion, had the FBI or the federal government had not caught up with this guy, this guy probably would have been like a Bernie Madoff, but only with a whole lot of ties to the mayor and, you know, police chiefs, not only in New York, but in, not even not only in New York City, but in Westchester County and who knows where else. So this is the type of guy that um, Jonah Resnick is. All right, so let's get into the defense. So they say like two months into their relationship, Seabrook wrote him a letter saying that he was thankful for their friendship. And so Jonah, pretty much seemed like a, build, a millionaire. You know, if you own buildings on Broad Street and Wall Street, you know, you really gave off the, the view that, or uh, the effect that you were a millionaire. So Seabrook did not know that this man was not a millionaire. Um, let's see, where we go from here. Um, he knew Seabrook liked golf, so he took him golfing. And um, let's get back to this two and 20 deal that we talked about earlier. And this is where the defense um, comes down on this. They say that he told Seabrook that if he invested $20 million, that in a month, it would go up 50%. And they showed records that Platinum Partners had never gained 50% profit in a month. They said the highest, let me just put it this way. 
the average um, gain or increase in platinum partners was only around 18 percent in a given year not a month so this number of 50 percent profit in a month is something that Jonah cooked up they said that Huberfeld would have never represented that his company was going to give you 50 percent on your money in a month first of all oh hold on the lights are out we have it on the timer hold on let me turn it back on okay I guess I'm not by the sensor all right so he's saying that Huberfeld would have never represented his company like that and um, you can easily check to see that his company has never earned that kind of money. So it was all a, a fiction thing that Jonah was saying about this deal. And he also said that even if it was 50% and this fund did go up and they, and they earned $10 million in that, 50, in that um, month, And see, this is supposed to be a two and two and 20 deal. And that's some sort of term that they use in, in finance that I'm not familiar with. But if the profit was $10 million, 20% of 50 of 10 million is 2 million, right? It's 2 million, 10% of 2 million is 200,000, not 100,000, right? 100,000 was the number that Resnick said that Seabrook would get if he invested the $20 million, that he would get 10% of the $2 million. 10% of $2 million is 200,000, not 100,000, okay? They said that Huberfeld manages hedge funds. He knows numbers. He is not going to say 10% of 2 million is 100,000. That's Jonah's idea. That's Jonah's plan. That's what he's saying. He's lying. This was never an offer that Huberfeld made. They went to Huberfeld's past. I'm trying to, I'm skipping around a little bit, but they said that he built a company, a kosher um, deli company, a Kosher Deli, he built it into a company. He went from zero to 300 million. He's managing funds. He, that the Platinum Fund, let me see if I can find this graph. He said the, the Platinum Fund that Platinum Partners has. You see, I got a thousand notes here. And, um, you know, I'm glad I did take these notes. But I'm just going to go off the top of my head right now. They're saying that Platinum had over a million dollars in investors in, in investments. They were handling, I think it was $1.8 million, $1.8 billion, excuse me. Hmm. Oh, okay, $1.28 billion. This is the type of money that Huberfeld was managing. They said that the COBA, their $20 million in the whole scheme, so this is the COBA money that was deposited. That only represented 1.6% of what Platinum Partners was dealing with, okay? So they're saying, why would Murray Huberfeld, who built the company from zero, to 1.2 billion dollars jeopardize everything that he had worked for his family his reputation in the Hasidic community for 20 million dollars for 20 million dollars which only represented 1.6 percent of platinum partners at the time they said that doesn't make sense um they said that Seabrook made it known that he wanted to run for mayor one day and that he, you know, really appreciated the friendship that he had with Jonah because Jonah seemed like a powerful man 
and he also appreciated the relationship that he had with um, Huberfeld because Huberfeld was a very powerful and wealthy man as well and he also had ties with the Jewish community which um, I guess was attractive to, attractive to someone who wants to be mayor and they're saying that there's nothing wrong with that that's just you know people coming together um, now let me just try to jump around a little bit they also talked about the money that was invested by the COBA now we know that at that first meeting that they had um, put $10 million from the annuity fund into Platinum Apartments, right? We know that. But they were saying that, um, and we know that there was a letter that was generated by the finance advisor saying that Platinum Partners, they, there were some red flags. There were four red flags that I went into in my last video. But they're saying, the, the, the defense is saying that there was also another letter there was also another letter that the defense, that the prosecution didn't show us. And they were saying, let me try to find it now. They said that this second letter from the advisor, from Tom Reynolds, said that Platinum Partners was a reputable firm. It said that it had had been, in the, had been in existence for 11 years, that it had a five-star rating, and the fees were in line with other fees, and the auditors of Platinum Partners were reputable, that they were aware of the orders and everything looked in order. All the other matrix were in line with industry standards. This letter also they produced in court, and they said that the, the prosecution did not show us that letter, okay? So, they said that the letter that they showed us was from the lawyer, a lawyer, um, Ween, and the letter did outline four red flags. And they said that that was just a process of a good lawyer looking at something and, you know, doing his job as far as alerting the board to any type of um, problems that they might encounter down the line. That was just what lawyers do, that they, um, they point out all the different things that could go wrong. And it was just a smart lawyer raising concerns. That's, what he, that's how the lawyer put it, just a smart lawyer raising concerns. And um, they said that um, all the concerns were satisfied. Um, one of those concerns was that that Platinum Partners had said is that in the hedge fund, you know, they invest in other things. They invest in oil wells and things of that nature. And if you wanted to get your money out, that it would it would take time because they didn't have to pay you in money. They could give you shares from a, a oil well or things like that. And the COBA, you know, they didn't really have any use for shares in the oil well or anything like that. So they didn't want that. So they worked out a contract, a side letter um, that said that um, they would be paid in kind. Like if they gave cash to the Platinum Partners, they would be paid by Platinum Partners. And they said that also concerning the five million dollars from the general fund. Now they went into that. They said the general fund that the five million dollars came from, um, it had you know a balance of about six million dollars, and it had been you know, like over seven million dollars, you know, during 2014, 2012. Okay. Now if you could picture the picture that they're trying to paint, they're saying that this was the rainy day fund. Okay, so I'm gonna put RD, Rainy Day Fund. And it consistently had seven to six to seven million dollars in the fund, and it was only getting one percent interest. Okay, so you have money in this account. You have six million dollars in the account getting one percent interest in a money market account. 
So that's only generating $60,000 a year. Whereas if they tried to invest that money, being that it's a rainy day fund and they're not using it, that they were looking at maybe that $6 million getting 10% at least a year, okay? If it gains 10% a year, it's 600,000. And if it gained 18% a year, which was the average for Platinum Partners investments, they would have gotten 1 million a year. 1 million, they would have made 1 million off that 6 million. That 6 million at 18% interest would yield $1 million at the end of the year. So that's what C. Brooks was trying to do. He was taking money that was in a rainy day fund and he was trying to invest it. It was just sitting there. He was trying to invest it to get that interest rate that um, they had been um, talking with Platinum Partners about. Okay, they said that um, for the four months that from, from March till June, when this transaction happened, the $5 million transaction, the $5 million from the um, rainy day fund, when this happened, they had already been invested with um, Platinum Partners. They had already invested the $10 million in January with Platinum Partners, so now it's June. They said, well, in January they signed the resolution. In March, the money went from Platinum Partners into the, into, I mean, went, went from the union to Platinum Partners so they could invest. They said in the three months from um, March 1st to June, the, the Platinum Partners account had grown 3.5%, 3.5% interest in three months on that $10 million that they had invested in Platinum Partners in the beginning of the year, in, in, um, in March. So, theoretically, they were looking, that was one quarter. So, in three quarters, they were estimating that it could possibly be somewhere around 10% interest that they would get if they invested in Platinum Partners. So that was the reason why the $5 million was invested in Platinum Partners um, of the Rainy Day Fund or the General Fund. Not because Seabrook was trying to put the money into a sinkhole, not because you know he was trying to get some type of personal gain, but he was trying to invest the money in order to take money that was dormant, that wasn't in, was getting any interest, and he wanted to try to grow it. And the reason why they said that he was trying to grow it is because um, Elias had wanted to make the correction department's union more similar to the police department's union. And in order to do that, they had to hire five more trustees five more union, union trustees, which was gonna cost the union an additional $500,000 a year. So, you had, um, during the testimony of the treasurer, Michael Maiello, saying that he knew about this number and he was suggesting that they could cut back. They could cut back on their expenses in order to meet this five, K five hundred thousand um, dollar increase in the expenses that he didn't feel like that five million dollars should have been invested in um, platinum partners and in a sense he's correct because they were spending one point three million on um, public relations you know they showed a chart where one point three million was spent in a year on public relations. And they were saying that that could have been cut down to like under a million or you know 500,000, which would have been enough money for them to 
have their trustees. But the, 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 um, the lawyer made it clear that, you know, it's kind of hard to cut back. You know, it's very hard to reduce your expenditures. So people more or less try to increase their income. And that's what um, Seabrook was trying to do. He was trying to increase the income. And he also noted that even though at the meeting, I mean, that um, Mikey Aiello talked about the Puerto Rican Day Parade that happened after the um, transfer of the $5 million from the Reading Day Fund or from the General Fund into Platinum Partners. He noted that after the transaction, yeah, people were upset about it. But at their next meeting, no one had a word to say about it. Everybody understood why he was doing it. And he also said that that bank transfer for $5 million, he showed on the bottom of that order from Seabrook to the bank to transfer the $5 million to Platinum Partners, on the bottom of it, it said, contact Mr. Maiello. So it wasn't that Seabrook was trying to do it behind anybody's back, do it behind, trying not to do it behind Mikey's back. He put on that email that he sent to the bank to see, to contact Mr. Maiello, all right? And he's saying that the bank transferred the money but they really weren't authorized to do it. And Mikey came and he um, faxed them his signature so it went through. But from Seabrook's point of view, his lawyer's point of view is that they weren't trying to circumvent um, Mr. Maiello, that it was on the document that the, the bank was to contact Maiello. And also, you gotta remember that um, this is not the annuity funds money, so it was no reason to bring it to the annuity fund trustees because this is general fund money, it's not trustees money. So they made, they, I mean, it's annuity fund money, so they made that distinction, all right? Now, let's see. They also went back to the Farragamo bag. Okay, the Farragamo bag. They said, yes, Jonah did give Seabrook a bag, but Seabrook is saying that the bag has cigars and it was a Hanukkah gift. So we're December 11th, 2014. It's almost Christmas. They said that Jonah Resnick went away. They said that they had a, they had a calendar. Now, I don't have a calendar, but they said, the 11th was, um, what, Wednesday? No, 11th was Thursday. December 11th was Thursday. They said December 11th was Thursday. Jonah Resnick was going away. He was going to Israel for, for Hanukkah. So this is Thursday. Friday is the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath. Sunday, the 14th. So this is the 13th. So he gave Seabrook the gift on the 11th because he was going away. He couldn't go on the Sabbath. So he waited till Sunday and he went to Israel. That's why he gave Seabrook that bag and that bag has cigars in it. And they're saying that it did not have $60,000 in that bag. And they went back to the video. They showed the video. Let me widen the screen once again. Bear with me, y'all. I'm working alone. <laughs> they showed the video with Resnick coming out of the Ferragamo store. Like I said before, it wasn't in a gift bag. It wasn't um, in a Ferragamo bag. He had already had the bag out and it was around his shoulder. When he comes out of the store, they show him going into the building with the bag like this. And like I said, 15 minutes later, they're showing the same clip that, that the prosecution showed. They show him coming out of the office, I mean, coming out of the office building, going into the street with the bag like this. And they're saying that 
If you have $60,000 in cash in a bag on December 11th, two weeks before Christmas, and you're getting ready to go out on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, you do not carry a bag filled with money like this. You carry the money.